dollar, dollar, dollar. Dirt and money, no soul. Had to go and get it, ain't no time to kick it. Got a stack of flip for my foes. Dollar, 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 dollar. Please tell me you can hear me. Don't turn your back and don't declare me. Just let me know if you need me. Dollar, 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 dollar. Let me watch out for my partners. Keep my money long, get my team strong. Let me run away from my problems. Yup, let's get original crew. It's your boy DJ New Kid, your girl. Sierra Nicole. Back on the channel with another Mr. Ballin video for y'all today, man. We got top three scariest run-ins with unknown predators. predators. <laughs> another segment from the missing 411. Yo, somebody did come in and say, can we get back to it? And I was like, yo, you know, we haven't did a missing 411. It's you know, been a while. The missing 411s be real true. Well, all of these are true stories. Yeah, they so all like, are. But yeah. I don't know. The missing 411s be a little, little bit more extreme, a little bit. You know what I'm Sometimes, saying? yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. hey, what? Whatever. So with that being said, man, make sure y'all check out the links in the description box. Down below. You already know where to go, man. You want to first support, you got to do it. Check out down below. Also, if you enjoyed today's video, as always, man, mm -hmm. lock it in with a thumbs up for us. But let's go ahead and kick it up. You know, already know what time it is. It's Mr. Baller time. Let go. <laughs> if you weren't already afraid of the woods, you will be by the end of this video. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please release a massive, <laughs> a massive saltwater crocodile. <laughs> so if that's of interest to you, please release a massive saltwater crocodile inside of the like button's house. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. On August 2nd, 1963, four-year-old Bobby Pankman, along with his two older brothers and his two parents, headed off to a camping resort on Deep Lake in Washington State. The following day, Mrs. Pankman, whose name was Edna, decides she wants to take her three sons down a logging road that was right- Hold on, give me my, give me my pad. 1963. Give me my pad, my pad. 1963, child. four-year-old, right? Hey, I gotta keep over. I gotta keep notes because I be a little lot. What year? 1963. We can roll it from right here. 1963. I be having to keep notes because I don't want my facts to be thrown off. No. <laughs> well, not my facts, but what I'm yeah, trying yeah. to speak my, my knowledge. In 1963, four-year-old Bobby Pankman, along with his two older brothers and his two parents, headed off to a camping resort on Deep Lake in Washington State. The following day, Mrs. Pankman, whose name was Edna, decides she wants to take her three sons down a logging road that was right behind their campsite that she had heard fed out to this beautiful little waterfall that she thought her sons would like to see. Edna gets the boys ready, she says bye to Mr. Pankman, and then she and her sons take off down this logging road. And as soon as she's on the road, it occurs to her that it's totally overgrown the grass is really high it's you know rocky and bumpy and she's thinking to herself there's no way any vehicle is getting down this road and probably there's been no vehicles on this road for a very long time this is a very isolated place on this campsite so they walk for a little ways on this overgrown logging road until they see there's a turnoff that leads down to the water and this little waterfall. And so right away she saw there was all this brush they were gonna need to walk through and the ground looked pretty rough. And Bobby, her youngest, the four-year-old, he didn't have shoes on. He was going through a phase where he refused to wear shoes. And so it hadn't really mattered the entire duration of walking up the road, but it seemed like this might be too much for him to walk on. And so she told Bobby to wait on the road and she told her other son, Jimmy, the six-year-old, to wait next to him. Those two would stay on the road together while she and Bill, the 10-year-old, would go past the brush, go down to the water, check it out for a couple of minutes, and then she would come back, she would pick up Bobby, and Jimmy would come along, and then they would go down and look at the water, and then they would leave. Bobby didn't seem to mind, so he just sat on the road, and Jimmy was a little bit frustrated that he couldn't go with the first group, but he sat down too, and Bill and Edna took off past this brush down to the water. Now the distance between where Bill... <sighs> this just don't sit sit right with me. You know why? Why the hell would you leave your four and six year old there by themselves? Mm -hmm. And you and a 10 year old? Why, why the dad didn't go with him? Mm. 
Because my thing is the dad should have went because the dad could have been with the sister. Or we should have just sister. like turned back around. Because I don't even know what happened. But we should have just turned back around, took them back to the dad. And if you and the 10-year-old wanted to go, y'all could have went. Whatever the case. The 10-year-old, ain't going to lie. Or the you could have went and got him some shoes. Or whatever the case. The 10-year-old like too young. I mean, but the, her, her only reason was because the 4-year-old didn't have on any shoes. But so, was, to be real, saying? you was just out okay. in the wilderness in the woods, but you by yourself with three... Young boys, yeah. that's too much to handle for one mm -hmm. parent anyway, especially when you got two there. Edna and where Bobby and Jimmy were was only about 10 feet. There was just this brush right in the middle of them that did obscure their view. They could not see each other, but they are very close to each other. And so Jimmy is sitting next to Bobby and he's getting increasingly more and more restless. He wants to go down and look at the waterfall. He wants to be down there with his older brother and his mom. And so at some point he just can't take it anymore. And Jimmy does something that to this day he regrets every single day. And that is he got up and left his brother. He went through the brush down to where Bill and Edna were. And as soon as Edna saw him, she was mad at him. And she goes, what? You left Bobby up there? Come on. And so they turned around after about 60 seconds and went right back up. And when they got back, Bobby was gone. And at first, they're not like, oh my goodness, someone's abducted Bobby because there's no one on this road. They'd come up here and, and recognize that it's very remote, it's isolated, there's no cars that come through here, they hadn't heard anything. And so their first instinct was, okay, he probably got up, you know, and is behind a tree or, you know, he walked down the hill over here or he's nearby. And so they're yelling for him, they're walking around and no one's panicking yet. In fact, really, Edna was just annoyed with Jimmy that he had left, you know, Bobby, and that he's to blame right now, but it's just an inconvenience at this point. But after a couple of minutes, when they can't get Bobby to yell back where he is, they start to realize they might have a problem here. And so Edna becomes more panicked and she's yelling at the top of her lungs for her son. She's having her other two sons go look down by the water, go look over there, but there's no trace of him. And they can't believe it. It didn't make any sense because I mean, he's four, he's got no shoes on, they didn't hear anything. How could he be gone? But he was gone. And so finally, after a couple of minutes, Edna rounded up her other two boys and they ran all the way back to the campsite where they got Mr. Pankman and they hailed the police and very quickly, a big search was launched up on that logging road. As soon as the police arrived, the first thing they did is they pressed Edna and the other two boys about what did you hear? You know, you had to have heard something. He was only 10 feet away from you and he was within earshot of you, certainly. You know, what did you hear? Did a vehicle come through? Did you hear an animal? Did you hear anybody talking? And Edna and the other two boys, they swore that they heard nothing, that they're just as baffled by it as anybody else. And so the police really didn't have a good starting point of where Bobby could have gone. And in that area, there wasn't any, you know, steep drop-offs or obvious places that Bobby could have fallen into or gotten trapped. The water for the waterfall, it's not deep. It's this little tiny brook. You know, it's, it'd be difficult to drown in that little brook. So they just basically started fanning out in all directions, hoping they would, you know, find a piece of clothing or some other clue that would indicate where he went. After three days of searching that yielded nothing, they finally brought in a wow. bloodhound to try to find him based on scent. And so they had the dog smell one of Bobby's shoes and the dog immediately seemed to key in on his scent in the area where Bobby had gone missing. And the dog turns and starts running up the, the logging road away from the campsite, so farther into the forest. And it runs for almost two miles and it never seems to waver. It's clearly picked up Bobby's scent. And it stops at this fork in the road about two miles away from where Bobby had gone missing. And it keys in on this one area right at the fork where there wasn't anything significant. It was just this bare patch of dirt. And so the police, they uncover the dirt a little bit. There's nothing there. They're looking around the area that there's no indication that Bobby was ever here. So they give the scent back to the dog. And again, the dog just keeps tracking to this one section in this fork in the road but they didn't know what to do with that information because there was nothing there. The search for Bobby was called off after seven days because they could not find anything. And so the lead investigator came out and did this press release where he basically said, we have no idea what happened to Bobby. However, we do think he was abducted. And his reasoning for this was pretty straightforward. Bobby was a young kid that had no shoes on in an unfamiliar forest and he was only out of eyesight for two minutes. So how far could he really have gotten? Certainly not far enough that his family wouldn't have found him after those two minutes were up and they began looking for him. And so if you go down the abduction rabbit hole, you start with, okay, a person must have taken Bobby. But for a person to take Bobby, that means a person had to be 
in this area that was super isolated and remote and they hadn't seen anybody in the area and there were very few campers at the campsite. So realistically, if a person was gonna abduct Bobby, Possibly. they had to have been planning it and had to have been hiding in the trees and or stalking this family until they got to that spot mm -hmm. where Jimmy left Bobby and then this person, you know, runs out of the tree line, runs over to Bobby, picks him up without Bobby making a sound, he muffles him and he runs away into the woods carrying this child all in a two minute window, which was a totally abrupt window. It wasn't like this obvious thing that Bobby was gonna be left alone. It looked like Jimmy was gonna be sitting there with him, which would have been a deterrent, you would think, if someone was trying to abduct Bobby. But nonetheless, this window presents itself and this person runs down and takes Bobby. It just seems like that person would need to be really fixated on Bobby, one. And there wasn't a clear reason for why anyone would be very fixated on Bobby or this family. And two, they would need to be very strong and quick and agile, more than the average person. So we're talking like a professional athlete level of agility and physical fitness. And so while it's certainly possible that a professional athlete had been stalking this family and then ran down in this tiny little window of time and stole Bobby away without getting detected and then evaded the law for seven days in the middle of the woods, while that's possible, it's pretty unlikely. And investigators reached this conclusion. They thought, you know, it, it does seem pretty unlikely that a person did this. So they moved on to animals and they said, okay, maybe a bear took Bobby. And so they brought out bear sniffing dogs to search the area for signs that a bear had been there and there hadn't been. And so they said, okay, maybe a cougar had been there. And so they brought out a cougar expert who looked around the area and there's no signs of a cougar in the area. Plus, there was no blood anywhere around the area where Bobby had been taken. There was no drag marks where if a predator were to grab you, they would need to drag you away. There was no drag marks. So it seemed like, okay, the, the, the large predator theory also has problems with it. And so the next theory offered up was, well, maybe a giant eagle swooped down and picked Bobby up and flew him away, which would account for why maybe it was quiet and there was no drag marks, there was no blood and why he's just gone. But that was when authority said, okay, we clearly have no clue. And so that's why they gave the press release and basically said, we just, we just don't know. And so while we probably will never know what happened to Bobby, it does seem likely that something took him. And whatever that something was, it was intelligent, it was fast, it was strong, it was agile, and it had been watching that family. Because as soon as that two minute window presented itself, where Jimmy was gone and Bobby was vulnerable, it swept in so fast that no one heard it, no one saw it, and it took Bobby somewhere and did something to him. Mm. Whatever it did, it probably wasn't good. So, uh, wow. so my question is, what do you think happened to Bobby? Because I, I got my, I got my logic, and and I know Jimmy, his brother, is like he like, said, he, like he blames himself so much, but it's not your fault. It's not your fault. You're a six year old. Try, you're not responsible to be watching your four year old brother. It's not your fault. You're a child. You're a six year old child. You wanted to go see. That's what kids do. Yeah. So but it's to, not your fault. But to be honest, I don't know. Because I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, in, the, in my head, I was like, well, maybe a bear. Okay, we ruled that out. Oh, it's like, okay, maybe another animal. Okay, we ruled that out. An eagle. Even even if it was an eagle, I felt like you would have still, nah, still, still heard him. The scent. But you would have still heard him scream. He would have screamed. Up, yeah, yeah. Heard he would have heard. So I'm like, it wasn't okay. an eagle. So we ruled that because the scent, the out. scent lingered for two miles and it came to a fork in a row. Just right. And here. I wish I would know what type of fork in a row was it. Because was it a fork in a row where cars can go? Yeah, 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 yeah. Reason why I believe. So you think a car possibly? Because when nineteen, think about it, 1963. 1963. Mm-hmm. I fully believe the car was parked there. Probably was was waiting, watching, watching and waiting until I believe he was kidnapped. Reason why all them things he was saying that that's not necessarily case. But we had to. Because some but we had to let me no let, let me let me let me get miles out. I let got me get you. Miles out. I'm I'm saying what he was saying was the case as far as somebody being super athletic. No, kidnappers are very strategic. To be honest. Criminals are way smarter than people try to say they are. Mm -hmm. Reason why I'm saying that is because you got to think about it. If he's kidnapping, he could have, they possibly could have saw her by herself with three boys. Mm -hmm. They, it couldn't have been that they were, it necessarily doesn't have to be that they were watching them the whole time. They could have just spotted, or they could have known that this is a frequent, frequent camping ground where people uh, come with family and they, 
You know what I'm saying? So they knew the area. Mm-hmm. I could have just been hiding, hiding out. Y'all, trust me, you can hide out in the woods and anything and people not see you. Mm-hmm. It can happen. The Holly Bobo situation. Just one of the situations. Or like the Holly Berry joint. That situation, her, she took her off her son like that. Kid was gone, right? In the movie. Mm-hmm. So I'm saying those situations can happen. What I'm saying is somebody could have just been in the, in the woods, and they saw they just saw the opportunity, or they are ki- professional kidnappers because we have those. Snatched them up like this real fast. Mm-hmm. Got out of plain sight like that. Doesn't mean they hurry up and want, ran. Doesn't necessarily mean that. They get out of plain sight. They probably know the woods. But my thing is, if it, if it was a car or something waiting on the floor, two miles whatever. away. No, I get that, but I'm saying there was no t- tire tracks. Did we did we look at at that type of situation? But they didn't take bring the dog out for three days later. That's the reason why I was like, why did y'all wait so long to bring the dog out? Y'all didn't bring the dog to three days after. But do you think there may still be like possible tire tracks though? But them tire tracks after three days could have been anything. Anybody could have drove. That's not fresh, fresh evidence. Three days, that's not fresh enough. I got you. You I know what you. I'm saying? Because mm-hmm. think about it. If if this is a fork in the road where people travel through, there's not necessarily a fresh. You know what I'm yeah, saying? I got you. So I personally believe, I believe he was kidnapped. We really will never know, but mm-hmm. that's just my assumption to it. Yeah. Looking at the history, it's 1963. A lot of crime happened in 1963 with serial. People like it just in the 60s, yeah. Like back then, and stuff the like that. crimes happen way more frequently than they do like now. Like those type of, it's, yes, kidnapping is more it's, it's more known now because it happens so much and it's way more televised. Mm-hmm. We got to also re- recognize the media back then wasn't as advanced, and so the information and the knowledge that we have now. They didn't have back then. Mm-hmm. So the word's not... But I believe he was kidnapped, though. Yeah. My whole thing is, why y'all didn't bring out the dog sniffers immediately? Mm-hmm. When y'all got a missing child and stuff like that, y'all need to bring all resources. I think... I hate how, like, detectives and stuff, they work slow mm-hmm. and be a little sloppy. Especially back then. It's the 60s. I, I think... I don't know. But your... your but what was your conclusion? You think an animal, though? No, I said I was uh, thinking of everything possible. But you never did. Yeah, I was just thinking of everything possible. That's why I was agreeing with everything that Mr. Brother was saying because I, I was like, okay, because we have to rule out things. You can't just jump to conclusions sometimes. So I'm ruling out, like, okay, possible yeah. animals. Because that's, like, your first thing when you're in the woods. You, that's Your mind goes to, like, some type of animal first. Yeah. Um, nine times out of ten. So I'm like, okay, we gotta rule that out. We gotta rule this out. I'm like, the only other option. I'm what? Yeah, the only other possibility is someone possibly was out there kidnapped them. The only never thing. Know. The, well, let me let me bring this up. Mm-hmm. The what I was saying was I didn't want to. I, I was ruling out what he said was the, about the athletic person. Somebody. Well, like, I get. That's why I was I, like, I, I get. I that. get why your mind will go there because it's like two minute span. You gotta be quick with it. Like two minutes, or you just gotta be strategic with it. Get out of place. Either way it go, it's still you quick, strategic, whatever the you got case a may knife, be. You say a word, I, you know. Kids. I mean, I get that we're not saying anything, but the movement of like yeah. two minutes and they went straight into searching. Like the mom, the mom. Whatever, but you know what I'm saying? You can but, only search so much when you got another two I mean, young I boys, get that. I and get you got that. one child missing. I you just gonna make sure them other two boys stay in sight because. I lost eye of one. But in overall, in the end, I feel like maybe nine times out of ten, it was a kidnapping. Yeah. Just, yeah. Headlights. In December of 1961, James McCormick Sr. was on vacation from his job as a fire inspector for the city of Portland, Oregon. And he was feeling bored, he was feeling kind of restless, and he decided he wanted to go do something fun with his 16-year-old son named James McCormick Jr. They settled on going hunting together as they were both avid outdoorsmen. And so they, along with their hunting dog, headed out to Larch Mountain on December 4th. Even though Larch Mountain was only 30 miles from the city, it was known as one of the most rugged and wild areas in the northwestern United States. And so the men arrive at Larch Mountain, they're excited, they hop out of the car, they put their gear on, and they begin hiking into the wilderness. 
Now the weather forecasters had said it was probably going to be pretty cold. There might be some light snow in the area, but the weather should hold for their day trip out into the woods. And so they hadn't brought any equipment to stay out for multiple days. This was just going to be a full day event, but back at night. But after walking for several hours into the mountains, they started to notice the temperature was dropping rapidly. And then it started to rain and then it started to snow all in a very short period of time. And initially they decided they were going to gut it out and keep walking a little ways, but they decided, you know what, this is awful and our stuff's getting wet and it's going to get dark soon. So let's just turn around and go back. We can go hunting another day. But it had started snowing so quickly that when they turned around to start making their way back to their vehicle, the snow had covered over everything enough that it looked a little bit different. And they didn't have a GPS. They were using a map and compass and they were not on a marked trail. They were just kind of walking around the mountains looking for a place to set up. And so they're walking back and they're making turns and they're starting to question where they are. And when they had walked for several hours in the direction they believed was back to the truck, well, they weren't anywhere near a road and they felt like they were in an area they didn't recognize and they realized they were lost. At this point, it was snowing really hard and it was starting to get dark outside. And so the pair decided, you know what? We gotta stay out for the night. We're just. That's why you pack for any and every possibility, especially stuff like this. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot, a lot of people I know that like do go camping and stuff. Mm -hmm. They might pack some. It might be a hundred degrees out of bed. They like I got my jacket because you never know yeah. what might happen. So you gotta, you gotta be prepared for any and everything. Seven. Starting to get dark outside, and so the pair decided, you know what? We gotta stay out for the night. We're just, we're not gonna find our vehicle tonight. It's too dark and we don't know where we are. So let's camp out for the night and tomorrow we will find our vehicle. But remember, they didn't have any equipment to stay out for the night. All they had was their warm clothes, but they didn't have a structure to protect them from the elements. And so they decided their best bet was to climb up into a tree because at least that way they're off the ground. They'd protect themselves from predators potentially, and the branches of the tree would kind of protect them a little bit from the snow and from the freezing rain. So that night, James Sr., James Jr., and their dog, they huddle in this tree. It's a totally sleepless, miserable night as they are just destroyed by snow and freezing rain and wind. And then finally, the sun comes up the next morning and there's a glimmer of hope, although it's still absolutely dumping snow on them. But they're thinking to themselves, this is gonna make a heck of a story when we get back. And so they climb out of the tree, you know, they stretch, they kind of, you know, readjust themselves. And then they begin walking in a direction that they think is the direction towards their vehicle. And for several hours, they're just kind of walking, hoping they're going to run into this road. And they don't. And at some point they realize once again that they are in the same position they were in the day before. They don't know where they are. And now they've walked even farther, potentially in the wrong direction. And so they stop for a second and James Sr. pulls out his map and he's trying to make sense of where they might be. He's looking around, he's trying to terrain associate to see if he can figure out if there's a specific way he should be going. When his son, who was a really tough kid, didn't complain about anything, he said to his dad, you know, I'm, I'm feeling delirious. I feel like I can't think straight. And it, it's hard for me to stand even. I'm, I'm going to sit down. And his dad's looking at him, not concerned about this, because it was a pretty miserable night the night before. And so it makes sense he might be tired. But, I mean, they had slept a full night's sleep the days leading up to this trip. They've only been out in the elements for one day. They do have warm clothes on. They do have food. They do have water. And so he figures his son will just sit down for a minute, and, and then he'll get back up and be rejuvenated, and they'll keep moving out. And so James Sr. continues looking at his map. He's looking around, kind of waiting for his son to say, okay, you know, I'm ready to start moving again. But his son just continues to deteriorate. He's speaking in nonsense and he can't stand up. And this was the first time that James Sr. really started to feel concerned for their actual safety. Because even the night before when they were up in the tree, even then it just felt like it was this crazy thing that was happening to them and that everything would be fine. And even that morning when they got up and it was still snowing and they're still lost, he had that, that, that optimism and so did his son. But now thinking, okay, we are potentially staring down another night out here and we're gonna eventually run out of food and water. You know, our clothes are starting to get wet. The temperatures are dropping below freezing. We don't have a, a tent, we don't have a shelter. And now something's wrong with my son, which is concerning in and of itself. But if he can't move, then we can't make progress towards getting out of the situation. And so James Sr., who was this really fit fireman, he said, okay, I'm gonna pick you up and I'm going to carry you. 
and he picked his son up, fireman's carry, put him over his shoulders, and for three hours, mm. James Sr. just continues to march around looking for the way out. And after three hours, when they had not gotten anywhere closer to a road or any civilization, and now it was dark out again, he collapses with his son, and he puts his son down by a tree, and he sits down next to him, and he's totally defeated. And he's like, we got to get ready for another night. We got to get back up in a tree and we got to do this again. And so as they're sitting there kind of talking about how they're going to get James Jr. up into a tree for the night because, you know, he's too weak to climb up himself. They both notice these very bright lights about 100 feet in front of them that look like headlights. And James Sr. is like, oh, my goodness, what luck. There is a road that we just didn't see. And there's a car that's parked right there. I'm gonna go up and communicate with them and tell them that we are stuck out here and see if they can give us a ride. Stay right here, I'll be right back. And so James Sr. gets up and starts running towards these lights because these lights are their lifeline and he wants to get to them before they potentially pull away without realizing you know, there's some people that really could use some help here. And so as he's moving, you know, 50, 60, 70 feet away from where his son and his hunting dog were, the lights just continue to go farther and farther away from him to the point where James Sr. stops and he's looking at these lights thinking, are those headlights? Like, what are those lights? And at some point the lights just kind of disappear into the forest and then they're gone. James Sr. looks around and he realizes, there's no road over here. I'm in the middle of the woods. Like, what were those lights? And so he stands there for a minute thinking to himself, you know, am I losing my grip on reality? Like, you know, what's going on here? And he turns around and he starts running back to where his son and his dog were. And when he gets there, only his dog is there. His son is now gone. And what's going through James Sr.'s mind is how, because he couldn't walk until now. And my son certainly wouldn't have lied to me and made me carry him all the way here. And there's enough light out that he could actually still see the footprints on the ground. And so he grabs his son's backpack that was left by the tree. He picks it up, he grabs his dog, and he starts yelling for his son and starts walking along the footprints that were left by presumably his son. And so he's walking along these footprints, and he's yelling out for his son, he's not hearing anything. And this whole time he's thinking to himself, like, why would he even leave? Even, even if he could move, why would he leave? You know, we're obviously in this together. Like, what's going on with my son? So he's walking, he's walking, and after about 30 minutes of walking along these footprints, because the snow was coming down so heavy, the prints were getting harder and harder and harder to track because they were filling in with snow. And finally it got dark out and then he really couldn't see the prints anymore. And now James Sr. is absolutely panicked. You know, this is a nightmare. Where's my son? What were those lights? Oh my gosh, it's gonna be another night out here. And he just picks a random direction and holding onto his son's stuff with his dog, he just starts running. The next day, James Sr. and his dog would stumble into this lodge that was about six miles away from where they had parked their car over at large mountain. Now, that doesn't mean they moved six miles to get there. They probably zigged and zagged all over the mountain and they covered much more than six miles, but it was a six mile shot to this lodge. And they stumble inside and it was just a miracle that he had found it. He basically had ran all night until he found a road and he traced it up to this lodge and he told the staff inside, my son is missing. We've been gone for two days now. He's out in the middle of the woods. He's hurt. Someone needs to go out there. And so very quickly, the police were called and word spread to the firefighters in Portland, Oregon, that you know the fire inspector's son is missing. And so 200 off-duty firefighters made their way up to the mountain as well to assist in this search. The paramedics wanted James Sr. to just go to the hospital and let the searchers do their job. But James Sr. was not about to leave his son and he refused medical attention and he went out with the first group of searchers. And somehow he was able to get them to the rough area that he was able to recognize as, you know, roughly where his son had been sitting when he went missing. They searched. Quick question though. Mm -hmm. You think those are the headlights he had saw? Or was he becoming delusional as well? I was thinking it because I'm like. Because y'all been, y'all been in the wilderness. Because you, I mean, because it can happen. Y'all been in the wilderness for two nights, for Cold. two days, two whole days. Going into two nights, mm -hmm. raining, cold, snow, snow and, and y'all no sleep, sleep deprived. Yeah. But just because you had rest doesn't necessarily yeah. mean you really got, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what I'm saying, ready for that. Because sometimes if you sleep so much, when you go missing sleep, your body is like, all right, I'm in shop mode because right. I'm used to being. But even if those weren't headlights, you know, still like seeing? with the. I mean, yes, what were you seeing? But also, how was the son able to just get up when he was just weak, couldn't walk, couldn't, like, talking? Like, but he saw his footprints. That's what I'm saying. Or, 
I think his son became delusional as well, too. Unless with him, with his dad carrying him, he was able to gain just a little bit of strength back and was able. And then when he laid him down, he wasn't. But again, if he's not in your right headspace, yeah. I don't know. This one of the tricky. He was able to recognize as, you know, roughly where his son had been sitting when he went missing. They searched that area and very quickly found James Jr.'s glasses case, as well as his boots and his socks, but no James Jr. Later in the day, though, they would find James Jr. He was about a thousand feet away from where his boots and his glasses case were found at the bottom of this cliff and he was deceased. Now, initially the thought was, well, you know, he must have gotten confused and, and walked away from where he had been told to sit and fell off this cliff. But they determined he did not die from the fall off this cliff. He had made his way down to that cliff and then died of exposure. So how was James Jr. able to suddenly be able to walk again? And once he had that skill back, why didn't he go to his dad? Why did he walk away from him? And why did he take his shoes and socks off to do that as well? And what were those lights that James Sr. saw in the middle of the woods? Because they weren't headlights. And it was only when he went to investigate them that suddenly James Jr. up and walks away. Hold on, Wait hold a on, bro. Wait no. a minute. I needed some. No. Y'all. Is it a possibility that dad possibly did something? No, I don't think that. But you never know, bro. I don't think that. Because again, it wasn't, he didn't uh, uh, pass because of a fall, like somebody right, pushed right. him or something. It was from, wow. But I don't know. I don't did they the dad possibly ate them. something in the wilderness? Well, no, because they already had water and food in their bags. They wouldn't have Or, have you know, fancy. some people were like, ooh, some berries, some natural I don't berries. Think so. But it could have been, I don't I mean, I mean, I don't know what he did because he was alone. So we, you can't account this, for, this you one know, is but hard. that one. This and then one it is... just, I have nothing else. It just ended. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, wait a minute, hold on. But This one hard to. Yeah, that one. I can't. I can't. I can't come up to with anything. I just. I really. I just think he was. He was like. Even though he. Well, you do have to understand too. By the time he got down to the bottom, because they found the socks and shoes, mm -hmm. and it's freezing cold. It's snowing. And so then he's, that alone, he's calling out. I think he just wasn't there. I, I think so. I think and that alone, like now you've t taken your socks, Shit. shoes off. Like, you're definitely exposed to, like, the, the harsh cold, weather. Yeah. yeah, so. I think he just wasn't there anymore. Like, mm -hmm. even your dad carrying you. Yeah. And he probably, like, I don't know, man. Yeah. That's, like, that's this is sad. This is a scary, sad situation. Yeah. And it's so, it's so, like, mysterious. Because mm -hmm. a thousand feet away ain't that far. Yeah. It's not that far away. And the dad was trailing him. Mm-hmm. I wonder was the dad running? You wasn't you wasn't gone that long away from him. Mm -hmm. Things like this happen all the time. Like things just in the blink of an eye, somebody just gone. You know what I'm saying? Or you like they couldn't have gotten that far, but then you never come across them. Because the never only thing is, again. it's 1961. Mm -hmm. The the use of technology, like maybe if they had a compass mm. or something. Could have. Well, they did have a compass. They had a compass and a map. I thought he said he didn't have a compass. They had a compass. Had a map. They had a compass and a. I thought they had a compass and a map. If uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, I but, thought they had a compass. But and a map. like the sense of direction was very off yeah. in this situation. They couldn't get a sense. Of, damn, that just that's sad to lose lose your son like that. Because I do know a situation that happened like that because. Uh, this teacher I used to have back in school, mm -hmm. his son, uh, his son graduated with my, well, was supposed to graduate with my sister. Mm -hmm. They was in the same grade, and they were out hunting one day, mm -hmm. and he accidentally shot his son mm -hmm. and killed his son while they were out hunting. Yeah. And I was like, you know what I'm saying? Those, like, and when I say he was hurt from that situation... Yeah. But it's like that's the only that's the, like something like this mm -hmm. that was like so bizarre. I want to say they said his son kind of got in the firing range mm -hmm. and he had his eye on the on the yeah. deer or whatever they were hunting and he kind of walked into the and got mm -hmm. so. In early July of 1953, Mr. and Mrs. Huggin, along with their three young daughters, left their home in Winnipeg, Canada for a six-week summer vacation. Hold on, hold on. Y'all know I gotta get my... <laughs>
In early July of 1953, Mr. and Mrs. Huggin, along with their three young daughters, left their home in Winnipeg, Canada for a six-week summer vacation. They were headed to the girls' grandparents' summer cabin in Wade, Ontario, which is one of the more remote and wild sections of Ontario. Their cabin was right in the middle of this huge swampy forest, and they were not too far from one of the biggest lakes in Ontario called Fox Lake. The family arrived late on July 4th, so they didn't do anything when they arrived. They just hung out at the cabin. And then early the next day, all the adults decided they wanted to take the girls to Fox Lake for the day. So they began gathering all the supplies they would need while the three girls played outside the cabin. Now, there's no neighbors or anybody else anywhere near this cabin. And so it was totally normal to have the girls just play outside. They were not concerned about, you know, them getting taken or something. And so the two older girls played in the front yard of the cabin and Geraldine, the five-year-old, was playing on the side of the cabin. So the two girls in front couldn't see Geraldine and the adults, they were keeping their eye on all three girls, but they were mostly just kind of going in and out of the cabin, getting their stuff together, periodically poking their head out, but the girls were fine. At 10 a.m. that morning, the parents had finally packed up the car and they were ready to collect the girls to head over to the lake. And so they went outside, they got the two girls that were out front, and they went to the side of the house, and they couldn't find Geraldine. Now, they weren't worried because where could she have gone? And so they walked around the house, they're yelling for Geraldine, and they asked the two girls, you know, have you seen Geraldine? Where'd she go? And they're like, oh, we don't know. She was just over on the side of the house a minute ago. And so they can't find her outside. And so they go in the cabin thinking she must have gone in there because that's the only place she could be. But after thoroughly looking through the cabin and not finding her, they started to get a little bit more worried. At this point, the adults start talking to each other and they're saying, did anybody see Geraldine in the past couple of minutes? Has anybody seen her? And they all said, yeah, I poked my head out the window and I saw her within the past 10 minutes right on the side of the cabin. And so they all agreed within the past 10 minutes they had seen her right outside the cabin. So they're alarmed they can't find her, but they're thinking, we're gonna find her. So they go back outside and they're looking around and they're yelling for her. Now, this is such a remote section of Ontario that there's really no noise pollution and sound travels really, really well. And so when they were yelling her name, it was booming through the woods. And even if Geraldine had, you know, sprinted for 10 minutes away from the cabin, she still easily would have been within earshot. And all she had to do was just, you know, yell back and they would see her but she didn't yell back and there was no sign of her anywhere. And so at this point, the family is panicking. And so they call the police, the police show up and they're looking around thinking, we're not gonna be able to search this very effectively on our own. This is a huge, wild, remote section of Canada. And so they called in some professional trackers that were familiar with this area to come in and help them with their search. They also called the army in Winnipeg to send over some people to assist as well. But as soon as the search started, the skies opened up and dumped rain all over the entire area, basically washing away any footprints that they could have used to potentially- wow. I hate, I hate when that, like that, like kills a lot of evidence, bro. Uh -huh. The rain, people just like like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and y'all are searching and just a big and ass storm. Rain. You like, like what the? The scent is thrown off. The steps are thrown. Like that's just a lot. Yes, damn. Rain all over the entire area, basically washing away any footprints that they could have used to potentially find her. As the day wore on and the sun was starting to set and there was still no sign of Geraldine, her father said something to the searchers that was intended to help them find his daughter, but it was just this incredibly heartbreaking comment. And what he told them was his daughter was afraid of the dark and that once it got dark out in the woods here, she's just gonna sit down and cry. And so that will stop her from moving farther away from us, hopefully, and we should be able to find her. But they didn't. And for three days, they looked everywhere for her and there was no trace of her. And to make matters even worse is the weather had been really rainy and cold, not below freezing temperatures, but close, like in the 40 degree Fahrenheit range. And she just had a light shirt and shorts on. She was not prepared for the weather. On the evening of the third day, they found footprints that they believed to be Geraldine's high up on this ledge in some moss overlooking Fox Lake. And the footprints indicated that this child, which was probably Geraldine, was looking out over the lake and then turned around and walked away from the ledge down into the swamp where her footprints dissipate. And so the search effort was pushed to the swamp and they had thousands of people that are combing through this mosquito infested bush to look for this girl. And once again, there's nothing. Then on the seventh day of the search, they find another set of footprints in the swamp around the area where they were looking for Geraldine but it wasn't Geraldine's footprints because they were these huge prints that if it was a human print, they would need to be an enormous human being. 
or these prints belong to some enormous animal, but they were unable to determine what animal it was. At this point, although there's not really any real evidence connecting that print to Geraldine, people are starting to suspect that whoever left this print or whatever left this print has something to do with whatever happened to Geraldine. Two days later, so nine days after Geraldine has gone missing, some of the professional trackers were two and a half miles away from where that large print was found in that swamp and where Geraldine's footprints were found upon that ledge. They found a piece of her plaid shirt two and a half miles away on the eastern shore of another lake called Long Lake. And so they pushed the search effort over to that section of Long Lake and within 24 hours they would find Geraldine's remains. The scene where Geraldine was found was bizarre. There was very little left of Geraldine and from what? what was left, it was clear there had been significant animal predation. And so initial thoughts were, you know, she must have been attacked by wolves. You know, that that's what killed her. But upon closer inspection, they saw that her clothing had not been torn and there was no blood on her clothes. So the animal predation had most likely occurred after she was deceased because they would have been able to pick around the clothing. Whereas if it had been a wolf attack, they would have cut right through the clothes and there would be marks that obviously, you know, she was attacked by animals. But Geraldine's remains appeared to have been dragged out of a nearby meadow to where she was ultimately located. And so they followed the drag line into this meadow and it led them to this opening where all the grass had been matted down. And investigators said it looked like something big had been laying there. And they speculated that that might have been the area where Geraldine had been killed. And then afterwards, animals had dragged her over to where she was found. And so investigators are like, well, we found that large footprint in the swamp on the seventh day in the same area where we had found Geraldine's footprints and we thought they might be connected. And now we're finding a large, what appears to be body print in this meadow that's right near where Geraldine's remains have been found. And so probably whoever or whatever left that print in the swamp is the same one that left this print here in the meadow and therefore is probably Geraldine's killer. But this left investigators with two theories that didn't really make any sense. The first one was, okay, these prints, the swamp print and this body print belong to an enormous person, like a giant who ran up to the cabin and abducted Geraldine and ran off and no one saw them or heard them. And for weeks, they've managed to totally evade capture despite being, again, an enormous person lumbering through the forest. So that seemed really unlikely. One, that this giant person even existed. And two, that if this giant person existed, how could they not get caught? They're so big running through the forest, they would be easy to spot. But if you rule out the enormous person theory, you're left with the enormous predator theory, which does make more sense on the surface because there are enormous predators that have attacked humans, so that does happen. Mm -hmm. But when they looked at her remains, they ruled out a wolf attack, and really, they ruled out animal attacks. But if this is an enormous predator, how did it kill Geraldine? The family was told that unfortunately, because there wasn't enough left of her, they weren't able to determine a cause of death. And so their best guess is she was probably mauled by wild animals, but they would even level with the family and say, honestly, we don't know what did this. So that's gonna do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's video, let us know in the comments what it is. Wow. That one got me stumped. That one, yeah, I don't... It got me stumped, but it don't get me stumped. Reason why there's not enough information. Like, even though Mr. Ballin told a lot of information, he left a lot of information out or he didn't elaborate. We don't have enough elaboration on enough evidence. Reason why? So we have this one area where a large footprint was left. Mm -hmm. We don't really know the details about how big a large footprint. Mm -hmm. It did happen in, what, 1953? So information is left out. You know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. the way we take information now, I don't think they took information back then. Mm -hmm. Some details. Mm -hmm. Also, you see her footprints, but you only, what it sounds like, you have one large footprint. So, if the ground is soft to see her footprints, the Why ground will be see multiple, multiple big footprints. Big foot oh, you know no. what I'm saying? Or even, or even, even where y'all found her at, y'all saw her footprints there, but y'all didn't see anything else. But y'all saw where there was enough where... So, it's a possibility she could have been kidnapped by somebody. But mm -hmm. only reason why I'm, I'm like hesitant with that as well, they moved too fast throughout the area. 
Unless you just know the area that good. Yeah. I don't know. This one. And I'm not going to say he left out anything. It's just. I, I need more information. I mean, that's all he got to give. Yeah, so it's yeah, yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and then it doesn't seem like from the information that we were provided, even like the searchers and the police, they were even kind of like, Lost with this yeah, one. like we don't know. Like there's not much to go on. Like her clothes are not like ripped as if like an animal, you attack. know, whatever attack, but there's not much of her left to even determine the cause of death to even, you know, see if it was an, act, an animal, a person, or was it from the weather? Did she, uh, she was only five, right? She was only five. Like, mm -hmm. was it a possible, did she possibly drown or something? Because when it water around? No, no, because no. no, no, they found her two miles away from that swamp area. Okay, well. It was two miles in a, when it, so it wasn't a, it wasn't a possible Well, I don't know. I, I really don't know. With this one, I don't, I really don't know. Like, it is, like, one of those situations where you just don't have a lot to go on. And it's just a lot of assuming or, you know, speculate, you know, because you don't Cause really I re know. One thing, I already know people going to get in the comments and say, oh, it's Bigfoot, it's Bigfoot. But besides the footprints of Bigfoot or a large animal, yeah, we really don't know information about, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So... That's the reason why I can't really speak on this. Again, it's in Canada. I do we from past previous past video. We know Canada is a little different than you know what I'm saying. And I'm not too well, honestly, with with the wilderness. I I've been in the wilderness to a point. Yeah. But it's only to a point. I ain't, I'm not an outdoorsy wilderness type of guy to go explore. And, and but my thing is. Y'all hit the y'all hit the footprint at the sw little swamp thing, right, mm -hmm. with the waterfall. But two miles away, were there any other footprints that matched that footprint? Mm, yeah. Y'all have body print in the, mm -hmm. and the body print could have looked as those a large human being. Yeah. What do we consider a large human being in 1953? Yeah. Large human being in 1953 could have been somebody she's for two. The, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because everybody, like, yeah, I get what you're height saying. changes over the years. Some people have like, saying. you know what I'm saying? So, you you get what I mean? Like, yeah, I somebody could have been six foot five, three hundred pounds, could be a large, large individual, could, could be considered large. Yeah. So we don't know. I, we missing the footprint. We don't have details. It was again. Remember, it's 1953. The way they take. Uh, evidence is different than the way we take it in 2022 now. So we have no yeah. photos. We have no true details of what the footprint looked like. It could have been a creature. could have been anything. I just can't. Like you don't really. You don't I don't know. have enough information on this to make, I, I, to make a full like conclusion as conclusion, to what you or think. Or assumption. Or assumption to what you think may have happened. We I do really, know for a fact she was kidnapped. At, but at what point was she kidnapped? But do we I don't know, know that for a fact? I said at what point she was kidnapped, I don't know. I I believe she was kidnapped, but I'm saying at what point? Because at the end of the day, kidnap, I don't only say kidnap as far as a human kidnapping you. An animal, I'm an saying animal an animal could have kidnapped like abduct her, abducted her as well. That's yeah. what I'm saying. I get what you're saying. I, but yeah. at what point? Because I believe she did, I think she wandered away. Mm -hmm. Exploring because she was by herself. Yeah. Kids have curious minds. Maybe she's seen something or Ooh. heard something. Like you don't curious know. Curious minds like, wandered away like, and wandered yeah. too far away. Even though she hear her parents, mm -hmm. a lot of kids think, "Oh, y'all playing? Let me run." Uh, yeah, they're chasing me. Let me run. And she could have saw the waterfall. Ooh, saw the waterfall. Went down there to the uh, little area mm -hmm. and could have got taken from that mm -hmm. area. My bad. I'm just slouching. But she could have got taken from that area. Mm -hmm. So at what point was she taken? That's Yeah, a, true. True. I don't know. I think, yeah, she, like, like I think she wandered off, but at what point was she taken away? Like, it's kind of hard, like, because everyone have their own opinion or assumption is, assumptions about what happened. But it's kind of hard to even form, like, a, you know, because you don't have that much information. Like, you have information, but you don't have, like, enough to be, like... Because we don't know the cause, you know, 
Adele. We really don't know how her clothes actually look. We don't know what's, what state her body was in. We don't know. Like, it's a lot of stuff you kind of don't know. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? To make so, them, but I do like know, you know her body was e eaten after the fact. You do, we do know that. Yeah, you know that. You know, you know certain things, but do you have enough to really to make a full? Especially conclusion. when they weren't able to determine how she actually passed. And so. that's the key point because even if she was kidnapped, y'all know special, special all even to now mm -hmm. how kidnappers work, especially those who kidnap children. Yeah, so they do try to you know what I'm saying. Yeah, kill so. her and then could have left her there. Yeah, and so, and the animals could have got her, and so. I don't, don't know. know. So it's sad. I, yeah, all that's of them the situation. Are sad, sad and unfortunate. Yeah. I it's some part of my mind is saying a predator got her, mm -hmm. but I can't rule out both. I just can't. Yeah. I'm like a some type of predator got her, but in my head, I'm also thinking she was possibly taken by a human. Either way it no. goes, she was horribly taken away. And something was done to her that we just don't know. Yeah. And we don't have enough still, information. Regardless of the situation, it's sad and yeah. unfortunate. So, yeah. with this one, I, don't, I ain't going to say I agree with y'all. I ain't going to say I disagree. That's just up for debate. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? This The past two, is, that was up for debate for y'all in the comments. Mm -hmm. I don't have a comment on them. <laughs> <laughs> so, with that being said, man, make sure y'all spam us up. Let us know y'all's thoughts and opinion. Did you come up with a conclusion on that one? No. So you don't, I, I like I said I don't really have okay, like okay. I have enough but I don't to okay I'll you know just make trying like, to see it. and then you didn't we don't have a conclusion for the second one and then uh, you you didn't I don't I, think the you only had a, the only conclusion I had for the second one is it was just due to like the harsh condition oh okay, yeah, yeah 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 like weather and all of that and then the first one with the four year old. Oh, the oh is that one I almost definitely I was like possibly kidnapping but. I, I don't know. All these are like my blow. Yeah, I don't know. It's just kind of like you ha have a little information, but then it's just like that's it, yeah. and there's nothing else. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then I don't know, but yeah, the first one possibly a kidnapping is what I concluded with that one. I got you. But I yeah. Got you. All right, man. But with that being said, again, y'all let us know, y'all peace on each three one, man. Sorry, sorry, we were on a rant, but. My mind's still running on curiosity, bro. Well, it's, <laughs> but as always, man, y'all know how it go. I do go by the name DJ Duke. This is We are. We are y'all. Ain't no time to kick it. Got a stack of flip for my folks. Dollar, 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 dollar. Please tell me you can hear me. Don't turn your back and don't declare me. Just let me know if you need me. Dollar, 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 dollar. Let me watch out for my partner.